All right, the session is being recorded. Good morning to all. Nice to see you back. Uh, I hope that you all had a productive uh, holiday uh, on Monday. And as you know, um, uh, we did have a plenary lecture Monday. In any case, I'm not disrupting our already disrupted schedule, so I won't repeat that to you. You just know that for the rest of the term, I plan uh, not to take these holidays if they fall on a Monday, although you're entitled to take them. And uh, the, you know, the, the virtue of doing this Excuse me, I have to hang up the phone because it's a robot calling me. Um, so I've done that. Um, the, the thing is that uh, you're entitled to take legal holidays, but I'm going to give the lectures at the uh, newly appointed times, Monday morning, 9.30, in this course to everybody, and then our section of MRM section on uh, Thursday. Um, so uh, I don't know. I can't turn it down for some reason. Well, let me turn the volume down. So I just I just can't stop this phone. I, the phone is out of control. Um, and it's very irritating because it never stops. Okay, uh, they're going to leave me a pointless message. I already know about this. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt my train of thought. Uh, here's the deal. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, record all, all of these, as you know. So if you miss uh, a lecture owing to a legal holiday, which you're you know, perfectly entitled to take, you can always uh, review it asynchronously. Um, all the lectures are, are uh, uploaded, the Monday lectures, to Zoom, uh, rather to YouTube, as you know by now, and the Thursday lectures are here on Blackboard. Um, and uh, they're also being uploaded to Zoom because some of the other students in the plenary expressed an interest in seeing them so i'm doing that too but please do realize that irrespective of the calendar um you're you're certainly um obliged to catch up on the material uh, so on the one hand take the legal holidays obviously uh and that's not a problem uh, but on the other hand make sure that you view the lectures asynchronously whenever you have an opportunity to do so because you will be held responsible ultimately for the material right should you write an essay on a particular philosopher whom we're covering you you'll need to uh, have seen the lecture okay so i i know you all understand that uh today i want to finish discussing the churchland reading which provoked some very interesting response on monday and i hope some of you have seen that uh, already now those of you who weren't in the lecture I'm going to quickly review Churchland's allegory, The Chinese Room, and then um, I'm going to review three different kinds of objections or two different kinds of objections, at least two or three, which could be made against Churchland's, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, I'm, I'm saying Churchland, but I mean Searle, um, Searle's allegory and arguments that could be made against Searle's allegory. I'll review two or three of those. And, and then uh, very quickly by the end of class or just before the end of class, I'm going to remind you what you all need to read for next week. Because this Searle reading will conclude the first section of readings in this course. Uh, so well done when we get through this week. Uh, you'll have basically accomplished one third of the mission. And as some of you know by now, and I'll repeat the announcement. Your first essay is due on the 12th of October, which is a Monday. That's a week from Monday. I'm giving you an extra week uh, since it's your first essay. Um, we're going to start the next section of the course next week, of course. But I'm giving you an extra week to pick and choose your topic and get your search done if you're doing some. And to write, most importantly, to write the essay and upload it on Blackboard. I can accept them any time before the 12th. If your essay is ready early, by all means, upload it. Um, if it's uh, not, then please upload it on the 12th. Um, if you're very late, I will assess penalties. I'm lenient now because I know there are there are issues with this online teaching, and not everybody has the privacy they want or uh, or need to write and so forth. But uh, you must still get the work in on time because I have to grade it, and you have to get a grade at the end. So. You know, please help me and help yourselves by getting the work in on time. Okay, that's a really important thing. Um, are there any housekeeping questions about that? Um, the guidelines, as you know by now, are all up there. And the essay topics that are pre-approved are all up there. You can pick any one that you want to answer and answer it, okay? 
Any questions about that before we move on? Are we required to add footnotes? Yes, I've been all through this, Mammy, and I've been over repeatedly. Um, you're required to add footnotes if you quote something or if you paraphrase something, yeah? In other words, uh, you need to read the guidelines on plagiarism very carefully, which are also in your Google Drive folders. A footnote is required when you quote words that are not your own. Okay, then you put quotations around them. You're welcome. And then you give in a footnote the source of the quotation. Also applies to paraphrases. If you take someone else's words and just rearrange them a little bit, they're still not your words. So you have to, in that case, not quote, because it's not a direct quote, but put a footnote and explain where where the source is that you got the you know the text from that you rearrange. Okay? Otherwise, you don't need notes. When you write your own words, you don't need to put notes. Okay. Any other questions? Very well. Let's carry on. So we looked at this really, I think, interesting objection by John Searle, a living philosopher, which he made to uh, the idea of the, the imitation game. And he concluded this thing called the Chinese Room. And as I said last day, and I'll repeat for the benefit of those who weren't able to uh, attend on Monday, um, if you happen to be Chinese, and I, I suspect there may or there may be a couple of people in this group who do, in fact, read Chinese. So if that's you, then don't call this the Chinese room. Call it the name of a room in a language you don't read, okay? So if you're Chinese, the Chinese room won't work. As an allegory, it would have to be, let's say, the Greek room or the Polish room or some room whose language you don't understand, okay? So if you're Chinese, then for you, it will be the room in a language you don't read, okay? If the rest of us who don't read Chinese, then it'll work as, a, as the Chinese room allegory, all right? Just to be clear about this. So what is Cyril trying to accomplish? I'll just review very quickly what he's trying to accomplish, and I'll do so by sharing um, a screen with you. Just bear with me. Some of you uh, on Monday saw these slides, but I'll just share quickly again so we can review. Right, I want to review with you what we looked at. All right, I'm sure you all see this, correct? Um, am I right? Everyone's seeing this, yeah? Okay, good. So basically, um, if you're all seeing this, then um, I can, good, I will, I will just talk through this and you guys can, um, you know, question me afterwards. But this is, in essence, uh, the, the allegory. You imagine that there's a person in a room and that person has a catalog and, uh, and an instruction set. These are two different depictions of the same thing. Um, the database is, or the catalog is there on the top and here on the bottom it's in a cabinet, a filing cabinet called data. And the guy on the bottom has a rule book. The one on the top, well, the data, there's also a rule book. He's probably memorized the rules. And then put in an output. So here's a Chinese. This outside the room is supposed to be someone who, who reads and writes Chinese. So she puts in a question or, you know, whatever in Chinese and in the input. And then this character reads it and looks for a match. Okay? In other words, when, when the person finds that this catalog contains all possible questions, so when this being Chinese, who this person has no understanding of Chinese, but with every possible question, there's associated an answer. So as soon as the person finds a match between the question and the input, then this person writes the output down, which is an answer, and puts it in the out box. And then this person gets the answer to their question in Chinese. And of course, they will assume, a reasonable person would assume, since they can't see into the room, they're putting in a question in Chinese, they're getting back an answer in Chinese. So the assumption is that, you know, someone in the room or something in the room understands Chinese, right? That's the common sense assumption you'd make. And that's a simple illustration of the same problem, slightly different here. The input's coming in on a monitor. Person has the database inside their cabinet, finds, uh, you know, finds a match in the data. The rule says, okay, when you find a match, write the spawning output, and you get the same thing happening. So here's a real example in Chinese. 
I got this from the internet. I don't read Chinese. I happen to know what it says. Um, if you want to know what it says, um, you don't need to know, but I'll tell you. I'll tell you afterwards. It's a legitimate question in Chinese, and um, and if we're in the Chinese room, we don't need to know what it says. This is Cyril's point. If you're in the Chinese room, then you have a database and a set of rules and or instructions, right? An algorithm, in other words. And if you're inside the Chinese room, if this is coming in through the input window, you don't need to understand it. You don't need to understand Chinese. What you have to do is look in your database. You're looking for a match. So, ah, when I see this shape, followed by this shape, followed by this shape, in other words, I'm getting a match, right, with the input. So now I've got a match in my database. Okay, I see this, I see this, I see this. Then produce this. This is the output, right? So the instruction says when you see this input, produce this output, and that's what you do. You produce this output, so that's the match that you found in your database, and the instruction said when you see a match, produce this output. That's also Chinese. You don't need to understand it, and you output it. And then what happens is that the people outside the room or the person outside the room, will, if they read Chinese, will, will assume whoever or whatever is in that room is an intelligent Chinese speaker, right? Because that's what it looks like. This happens to ask a question of what brings happiness. And the answer is given from an ancient philosophy text, the Tao Te Ching, and it says, be the stream of the universe. Don't ask me to explain that. I'll explain that next term when I teach Chinese philosophy. But for the moment, that's a, a, an intelligible question to someone who reads Chinese. And it's also uh, an intelligible and intelligent answer, a philosophical answer to someone who reads Chinese. So outside the room, people will read that and say, ah, well, whatever is in this room speaks Chinese, right? So now here's the contrast. Turing would say, obviously, and has said, that if you could set that up, then the Chinese room would definitely pass the imitation test for, for, you know, for Chinese readers, right? Definitely pass the imitation test because whatever question you're a asking it, you're going to get back um, an intelligent answer in Chinese. So you're going to pass the imitation test. You don't need to know what's in the room. In fact, it's so good that you couldn't tell whether a person who, who actually reads Chinese or a computer. And Searle is saying, wait a second. Searle's objection is that, yeah, we're simulating an understanding of Chinese, right? But the person in the room doesn't understand Chinese at all. Think about it. The person in the room is only following a set of instructions and looking in a database. And that's exactly what a computer does, right? Computer doesn't understand what it's doing. Computer only looks at a set of instructions and, uh, and a database and takes the input, you know, follows the instructions and produces the output. It doesn't understand what it's doing. It certainly doesn't understand Chinese, even if it's able to give answers to questions in Chinese. That's just because it's programmed to do that. Yeah? Are we clear? So basically, that is Searle's objection to Turing, um, that you can simulate things, but a simulation is not ever the same as the real thing. That's the main point. And specifically, uh, a simulation of understanding, says Searle, is not the same thing as actual understanding. Is this is this much clear, or any questions about that? That's clear. Okay, Abraham, good. Any other any questions at all? All right, that's the basic basic setup. All right, very good, very good. As long as you get that, because that's his allegory of the Chinese room. As I say, those of you who are, are Chinese, you pick a different language and, you know, the same argument will go through. If you don't understand Greek, then it's a Greek room, okay? Um, but if you have the instructions and you have the database, then you can communicate with a person in a language that you do not understand. And Searle's point is that you can simulate understanding without understanding. Just like, remember, we can simulate. There's all kinds of simulations out there now. Uh, we can we can simulate um, flight. Flight simulators are great for training pilots, but a flight simulator is not the same as flying an airplane, right? 
a flight simulator never leaves the ground. It's, it's simulating flying. And certainly you can simulate a lot of the problems or emergencies or malfunctions that would occur, miscommunications, weather. You, 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 you can simulate a lot of things in a flight simulator in order to train pilots how to deal with them if they really occur in the air. But the difference is that a flight simulator is never leaving the ground. So it can't possibly be the same thing as a, an airplane. It's not the same as flying. It's just simulating flying. Similarly, when we have a fire drill, uh, we simulate what would happen if there were a fire, right? When we're back in the building, I hope we will be some point, but when, resume, when we resume normal classes, uh, we're, we're going to have a uh, simulated fire drill. You know that. It happens in the middle of class, right? And the bell goes off. It's very loud. And everybody has to leave the building. And then, you know, 15 minutes later, they let us back in, right? Was anything burning? I don't think so. A fire drill is simulating our behavior um, to be safe and, you know, to escape a burning building. But we're simulating a fire. Nothing's really burning in a fire drill. And similarly, again, in a flight simulator, nothing is really flying. So Searle's point is that the Chinese room shows us that a simulation of understanding doesn't understand. Okay? It's just simulating understanding. So that, that seems like a pretty good argument. At least, you know, it's very creative, very important. And it's had a huge response from the AI community, a huge response from philosophers. It's, it, 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 the argument is from the 1980s, so it's already almost 40 years old. But it's provoked a tremendous response. If you Google it, if you look it up, you'll see all kinds of interesting replies to it, defenses of it, and also uh, attempted refutations of it. Okay, so if you're clear about what Searle is trying to show us, in, in a general sense, namely that a simulation is not the same as understanding. And you could say the same of Google Translate. Therefore, he would say the same of that. What happens? I mean, Google Translate is very powerful because you nowadays you can go from any language to any language, right? You could type in a phrase um, in any language. Well, not any, but dozens, dozens of major languages and many minor languages. You could type in a phrase and pick the language you want it translated into and it will instantaneously translate. You've, have you done this? Many of you had recourse to use Google Translate at all? Yes, you have, Melody. I use it quite often. Uh, you have also, for you use it for Spanish class. I'd be a little more careful about using it for, for coursework. Um, uh, be, you know why? Because it's not that good. Uh, it's a simulation, once again. Uh, when tourists come to my home or to your job, exactly, Sarah, that's what I do with it when I'm traveling in another country and I want a quick phrase, you know, if I, if I want to ask a question and I, I don't know how, I, I use Google Translate. It's pretty reliable. When I'm giving a talk in a, in a different country, when I used to fly around, <laughs> I used to, and I, I still do it online now, everything's on, on a platform, when I'm giving talks, to uh, an audience that's, uh, you know, from a different country. I often like to say thank you very much in their language, right? I mean, the talk is in English, but at the end, I like to just make an effort to thank people usually in their language so I can trust Google Translate. But I certainly can't trust Google Translate to translate more complicated sentences. If you start plugging really, um, you know, good literature in there, you'll not get good translations from it. If you start plugging in ambiguous uh, sentences, I went over some of them on Monday, which are humorous and so forth, it will not understand ambiguity or humor. It will give you a, you know, a pretty bad translation usually because it's not programmed to do anything more than to process simple language. Uh, and I don't know anyone who asserts that Google Translate understands any of these languages. Sir would say it's not understanding any of these languages. Like the poem, yes, exactly. You, even we can't translate poetry sometimes, you know? We don't even know what the poet meant. Sometimes even the poet doesn't know, you know? So interpretation is more difficult than translation, right? People who are simultaneous translators are really, really good at this. Uh, in the United Nations and other kinds of world forums where many languages are spoken in the house, uh, you have professional translators in a booth, and they're, this is the most difficult translation because they're listening to the language that's being spoken, and they're instantaneously, as they're hearing it, they have to understand it, 
and translate it into a high quality language, which is the language that they're hired to translate it into. So uh, this is going from all languages into all languages if you're in the United Nations or in high level conferences. And these people are really good, but even then they sometimes don't get it right. Even then, especially from Asian into Indo-European or Indo-European into Asian, for some reason, it's easier to translate, you know, French into Spanish or Italian into, you know, into Spanish or even English into Spanish easier than, let's say, Mandarin into Spanish or Japanese into Spanish or into English. Um, Asian languages are pictorial, ideographic. English languages are syntactic, syntactic, and it's really difficult sometimes to do simultaneous translation. There are wonderful translations, of course, but such works usually take a lot of time and effort by professional translators to do. So computers are not that good at it yet. And Searle would say, obviously, it's because they don't understand what they're doing. They're just looking at, you know, more or less a catalog of phrases um, and, and sentences that are stored. And then they're just basically rendering canned, more or less canned translations of those things into the language that the instructions are telling them to pick. So they don't pretend to understand. Um, but they could still fool, maybe still fool somebody into thinking that they do. But it's really a simulation, right? Not the same thing as talking to a human who really understands both languages. So um, what are the objections? Well, there are several objections that could be made to, to Cyril. And I'm going to kind of go through them one by one. I'll, I'll maybe go through three of them. And then I'm going to pose a, a paradox that arises that nobody thought of. I thought of this. I don't know anyone else who has. I haven't bothered Searle about it. and I haven't published a paper on it yet. But there's certainly something strange going on in that room that Searle himself did not. I don't believe he took account of it. And I'll share that with you at the end. So the first objection would be Churchill's objection. Right? When Searle is, is, is making a claim that uh, that understanding is irreducible, right? That's Searle's claim, right? That that a simulation of understanding is not the same thing as understanding. Why? Because understanding cannot be reduced to a complex algorithm, right? Understanding cannot be expressed as a computer program. This is a faculty of the mind. It ties up with our first reading on Descartes. Remember when Descartes said, how do we know the wax is still the wax? after we brought it from the table to the fire and all the properties changed. It's not appearing to be the same wax, but it's the same lump of wax. And what was Descartes' explanation? Remember, he said, it's the mind that understands. It's not the senses. It's the mind that has this faculty of understanding. So um, Descartes is also saying that, therefore, the mind's ability to understand, when you say, I understand something, or when you say, I don't understand something, you're saying something much deeper than this is an instruction set that I haven't been programmed to follow. <laughs> understanding is not reducible to an instruction set. It's not, it's not that simple. Um, so Churchland would say what? What's Churchland's response to Searle? What do you think Churchland would say as a materialist? Any ideas? No immediate ideas. The opposite. Well, yes, Mame, the opposite of what? <laughs> the opposite, definitely the opposite of something. That everything can be, yeah, ex well, no, the opposite of that, Ravel, not everything can be interpreted into ideas because ideas for, for Churchland are, are uh, that's not, Churchland is saying that everything can be explained in terms of the brain function, right? Materialist function of the brain. So ideas for Churchland is, well, the mind is reducible. It's the, what Maui says, the opposite. When, when, when Searle asserts that understanding is not reducible to a set of instructions, uh, Churchland is going to say understanding is reducible to a set of instructions, but not that the mind is following, that the brain is following. Right, that everything that we talk about as mind, remember Churchland, everything that we we talk about in terms of mind has to be eliminated uh, and and explained in terms of brain. So when we say that that I understand something with my mind, 
what we really mean is that my brain is doing something that I can't explain at this point, but that one day neuroscience will explain. So Churchland would say that if you understand English uh, or you understand Spanish, you understand Mandarin, he would say it's because your brain is able to do something that you yourself cannot explain in words yet because no one can, but that the brain is doing something that one day neuroscience will explain. And then we won't even need the word understanding because we'll understand understanding. We don't understand understanding right now. Uh, but it's because we don't understand what the brain is doing. That would be Churchland's response. So when Searle, Searle asserts in this allegory that a simulation of understanding is not the same as understanding, Churchland's response is that there's no such thing as understanding anyway, that it's really something the brain is doing. And we don't know specifically what the brain is doing when we say in words we understand this language. That really means the brain is doing something, and we don't yet have a mature neuroscience to explain to us what the brain is doing. But once we do, we can eliminate words like understanding, and then this whole allegory will become irrelevant. Is this clear? I think that's fair to, to pause it as, okay, everyone's clear. That, that is my you know, presumption about what kind of response Churchland would make based on his eliminative materialism, we would just extend that theory to Searle and he would make that kind of materialist objection that understanding is a word for something that's going on in the brain that we don't really have a better explanation for. So we use that very fuzzy word, but we'll eventually eliminate it, okay? So that's one kind of objection, so materialist objection. Not the only one, but a materialist objection. Okay, then we come to a second, uh, a second kind of objection. And this kind of objection is in fact what Turing would say. All right, this would be the functionalist objection. Right back to uh, Searle. Turing will remind Searle of his functionalist account, which is what? That a computer has three kinds of things going on, regardless of whether it's made of cardboard or transistors or vacuum tubes or integrated circuits or, you know, whatever the construction of the computer is. Remember, the structure of the of the computer is, is, is not so important as the function, and the function is, uh, it's, if it's a digital computer, which it is in this case, uh, in Searle's Mall, then it's a universal Turing machine. If it's a universal Turing machine, then it has input, it has an internal state, and it has an output, right? And the output will depend on what? The output will depend on two things. It will depend on the input that it's given, and then it will also depend on the internal state, which will include the built-in instructions, right? The program that's already been uploaded. That's part of its internal state, right? When you upload a program into, into active memory, um, then it's part of the internal state of the machine. The program is running. So that's part of the internal state of the machine. And then when you put data in, when you give data as input, uh, then then whatever's running in the internal state of the machine will take the data and operate on it according to the instruction set, eventually produces some output. And all universal Turing machines are doing this. And Turing is saying that that what we're doing is we're we're basically saying that the human mind or the human brain is doing just the same thing so when someone says good morning how are you today that's input that's a linguistic input for a human and you if you speak english if you understand english you take in the input and then the internal state of your mind or your brain however you want to discuss it like descartes would discuss it in terms of mind and Churchill in terms of brain, but it doesn't matter, Turing says, you can discuss it either way. When you hear that input, good morning, how are you? You have already a database in, in your understanding of that language, which, which is like your internal state. And it's just like the catalog, it matches. When someone says good morning to you, that matches in your catalog of that language. And so you know what the outputs are. And your internal state will tell you which output to generate. We have more flexibility maybe than most computers. So if someone says, good morning, how are you? Well, how you answer might depend on how you feel, right? Or how you answer might depend on who's asking. 
Like if it's, if it's, um, you know, someone like, you know, if your boss is saying, how are you? And you don't want to rock the boat. You say, oh, I'm just fine. Thanks. How are you? Right. But if your best friend is asking and maybe you really have an issue going on, so you're going to tell your best friend, no, don't ask or something terrible going on, you know. So the answer we give, says Turing, will depend on, as usual, the input and also our internal state. And then from that, depending on who we're talking to, that's part of the input, right? The input is not just the question, but the input for humans is who's asking, <laughs> Right. The difference between whether your mother's asking, your friend's asking, your boss is asking, yep, yeah. your child is asking, you know, different different questions with from different people will constitute the input. And then your internal state will process that, and then you'll output the answer. Of course, that happens quickly. In most cases, you say something like, I'm fine, thanks, how are you, right? That's the generic answer. So, but Turing will say, well, that's just, you know, that's just the program you're running. You're not doing anything different than a Turing machine. You're just doing it with a different structure. So there is no difference. Is this clear? And, yeah, okay. And so, so Turing dismisses the allegory because Turing is saying, well, excuse me, if the simulation is good enough, there's no longer any difference between it and the real thing. So basically... Uh, if it passes a Turing test, we're done. And uh, and the interesting thing is that uh, the alloyed re response to this. Okay, wait. Melo has a question. Wouldn't that be the difference between the two? A computer would rec would not recognize who to give a response to. Right. That's because uh, the computer may, may may not be programmed to to recognize who's asking. If the computer can't see who's asking. Then, then the computer absolutely, Melody, would not know who's asking. But suppose we're talking to Sophia. Uh, Sophia is programmed to see who she's talking to, right? So Sophia is programmed to do m many more sophisticated things than the average bot. Uh, definitely these online bots are very irritating. They don't know, understand much and they don't care who's inputting, definitely. But uh, Sophia is much more capable not only of seeing who's talking to her, but of reading their emotions. Yeah, she can read your facial expressions, and she can also read your tone of voice, probably. So she's much more sophisticated, and therefore could probably give different answers to the same question, depending on that more complex input. So she can process not only words, but also emotions, and facial expressions. So that's much more like us, right? So Turing would say, this is just a question of making your computer able to recognize richer inputs. You enrich the set that the computer can take in, expand it from purely written language to spoken language, and expand that to emotion, emotional content and facial expressions. And then you got a really high end computer like uh, Sophia who could joke with us that humans are only are just smart input output devices if you remember that in the interview when she said oh computers are humans she said humans are are very are very intelligent input output devices so she she's really taking Turing's <laughs> idea you know that we're you we're also universal Turing machines we're not digital though but we're functioning in a similar way <laughs> okay so that's one answer and this answer um, then is, is sheds light on, on the idea of different languages. Because if you speak, so if your native language, let's say, is English, then Turing might say, I mean, Turing died a long time ago, so we don't know what he'd say to Cyril. But again, I'm, I'm you know, hypothesizing. Um, okay, Abraham says fundamentally the stuff that the computer is made of is unconscious. Therefore, unconsciousness now, we're back to this. You've talked consciousness several times, and I like it because we're really asking this deeper question, too, about consciousness. All right. So, Abraham, let me play the devil's advocate since you're saying that consciousness cannot come from something that's unconscious, and I would want to agree with you. 
that a computer is made of stuff the components are not conscious so how the how could then the totality of the components be conscious that's a very rational argument Abraham and I like it but I'm going to play the devil's advocate and respond to you okay if I'm a materialist like Cyril and I'm not entirely that but, but I mean like Churchland if I were a materialist like Churchland I'd say to you okay wait a second Abraham what about the brain um, if the brain is what's producing consciousness, if we start dissecting the brain, do we find consciousness anywhere in the brain? I mean, if we start opening the brain, take an X-ray of the brain, do you see consciousness? No. If you take a uh, an MRI of the brain, do you see consciousness? No. Um, if we take do positron tomography, if we do any kind of imaging that you want to do with the brain, we're never going to see consciousness there. And if you open the brain up surgically and start looking around, poking around in the brain, uh, do you see consciousness? No. If you dissect the brain of a dead person, do you see, you know, the residues of consciousness? No. Um, is, is a neuron conscious on its own? No. Is a neurochemical transmitter conscious on its own? Is serotonin consciousness? Is, is dopamine consciousness? Is, no, none of those things is consciousness. So I'm taking your argument and I'm turning it back on you. I'm saying the brain itself is not made of anything that's conscious. So how could consciousness come from it? Well, the answer you could give, and I'm suspecting maybe you want to give, is the answer that Searle would want to give and the answer that I would want to give, maybe, which is that we're talking about something irreducible to begin with. We're not supposing that anything conscious could come out of something unconscious. So consciousness is not reducible. Okay? No, consciousness is not reducible. But we can't demonstrate that. And that's what the argument is. We can only believe that consciousness is not reducible. Okay? We can't demonstrate it. Um, if we demonstrate a computer that's even better than Sophia, that is so human that even humans would concede that she's like, totally human in her ability to interact, we would still not prove that consciousness is reducible. We just show that the simulation can get so good that it's really indiscernible from the real thing. That still doesn't prove uh, that consciousness is reducible, though. Okay? Um, and that's a debate that's not been resolved yet. So I just want you to... Is that all right? Do you, do you, do you get that? answer to your point great okay great um i mean the same by the way um yeah you're more than welcome but you know the same or it's a very interesting point you're making and the same point actually could be made about life and not so we, we could ask the same question could we not Abraham? we could say how is it possible that life emerges from something that's not alive so if we if we take a living organism that just died like a frog or you know whatever and we dissect it um all we see is is a bunch of non-living stuff at some point the cells die and they're not living anymore we ask how how, how does life come from non-life or or to take it the other way around if we take the components of life and put them in a test tube we never get life out of it you need life to start with I mean, we can fertilize, uh, you know, an ovum in vitro, right? We have this possibility now, this technology to take a live ovum and a live sperm, and you can actually do in, in vitro fertilization, and then you can implant the embryo, and it will actually evolve, it will gestate, and that's an amazing thing. But we're not creating life. We're still producing life from life. It has to be given right in order for life to emerge you know you're not creating the ovum and the sperm in a lab you actually need it from a person or from two people rather okay so life can only come from life uh and no one has yet managed to create life from just assembling chemicals in a lab similarly we can clone life i mean amazing right we can actually clone life but what are we cloning it from we're taking the dna out of a living organism and we're using that DNA to create a, a new organism, right? We're not actually fabricating the DNA from, from a chemistry set. We're still taking something vital, the blueprint for life, the blueprint for an organism, genetic blueprint, and we're using that to make a new organism. 
Well, of course, we're not now discussing the ethics of cloning. This is a this is a separate topic, Mami. We'll we'll look at ethics in the next section of the course, and that's a great question. But uh, we're not we're not going to go there now. It's one of the contentious debates. My point is more simple: that we don't seem yet unable to create life from non-life. And we certainly don't seem able to create consciousness from non-consciousness. I think that that you know, Searle would look at at um, at Sophia, and just as we can look at Sophia and say, yeah, she's a really good simulation compared to what we used to have, but she's still not the real thing. She's not really conscious. Yeah, you could make that argument. But what the formalists would say to you, and what the functionalists will say to you, is just this: that if you speak a language. You're not doing anything different from the Chinese room. What you're doing is, because you quote unquote understand that language, it means that you have that room in your head. So if you if you speak English, you're walking around with an English room in your head. And when two people meet each other on the street and they both have an English room in their head, they're able to communicate because they they can take it, match it to their database and produce output. And if you speak two languages, if you speak English and Spanish then you've got two rooms in your head. You've got an English room and you've got a Spanish room. So you can do it with both languages. You don't get them mixed up because you're able to know from the input which room to process the input in, right? If you hear Spanish, oh, that's input, and you know that that goes into the Spanish room, and you process it and produce the output in Spanish. You don't mix them up. Even children don't mix them up. Children can learn more than one language at once. Children can learn five languages at once, and they never mix them up. And the functionalist will say that's because each of those languages gets processed in a certain room, and the child learns not the language, but learns the way of processing that language because they set up that room in their minds or their brains, whatever you prefer. So however many languages you speak or whichever languages you speak, you have a room for that language in your head, and that's how you manage to to communicate with other people, but there's no such thing as understanding. We don't need to talk about understanding to make that happen. So the functionalist approach is just just reinforcing Turing's point. Then when we say we understand, what it really means is we're able to accept the input and matches up with stuff in our database. And then we can produce the output. And uh, uh, one way to reinforce that argument is to say, hey, what happens and here, here's an example. What happens when someone uses a word you don't understand? All right? Well, what do you do? You you speak English, but someone uses a word in English that you've never heard before. So what do you what do you say to them? What does it mean exactly, Veronica? Say, what do, I didn't I didn't understand that word, right? What does that mean? What does that word mean? Oh, so here's Turing. This is what Turing will say to you. Turing will say exactly because that word is not in your database yet, right? So you couldn't process that input. So you got a linguistic input in a language that you mostly understand, but that language that you mostly understand contained a chunk of input which you could not match in your database. And so you had to ask them what it means. And then you're going to learn a new word because if they tell you what the word means, guess what? Then you put that word in your database. You expand, you add new data to your database. So the next time someone uses that word, you know what it means. And so this is this is the functionalist explanation. So there's nothing, we don't need to talk about understanding. We need to talk about what's, what's in my database. <laughs> okay, do you see this? What's in my database, right? So we could we could give an account, as Turing would, of two people communicating in a language that they would both say they understand, but we could explain that ability that they have to communicate in that language without ever using the word. We don't need to use the word understanding. We need if we want to talk about it in a functionalist way, we could simply talk about input, which which is what one person says to the other one. And then we could talk about, does that input match up with what's in their database? And then they formulate an output, you know, which then the other person takes as input. And an example, Veronica goes on to say, an example that would be to infer the meaning of a word. Very good, yes, because we have a very rich program. You want to say our instruction set, if you want to defend Turing's point of view, is that our instruction set does sometimes allow us 
to infer the meaning of a word from context. Uh, that's right. We can sometimes make a very good guess, what we call an educated guess, as to what a word means or get some sense of what it means based on the context. Exactly. Meaning is often dependent on context anyway. So we can do that sometimes without any help. And it's often the case that dictionaries do not give one meaning of a word. Many, many words in any natural language can have a huge, any word could have 10 different meanings. So again, context is going to tell us. I, I think that uh, Chinese languages are like this. I'm pretty sure in Mandarin or in Cantonese, in the major Chinese languages, there are phonemes like Li, which can mean 50 different things. And it all depends on the specific context in which the word occurs. They're very common phonemes, uh, but they really are context relevant. So you have to know. Okay. So Turing would say that all can be explained on a functionalist account. And we, we can give a perfectly good functionalist account of how we're able to speak and communicate in a language. But we don't need to talk about this mysterious thing called understanding. We just need to talk about input, database, instruction set, processing, output. Now, it's, it sort of maybe doesn't make you happy because it dehumanizes what we think is, you know, communication, right? Um, but it, it still could really be that. So that would be the functionalist answer to Searle. When Searle says understanding is not reducible to a set of instructions in a database, uh, Turing's reply is, well, we don't need the word understanding to explain how people communicate. <laughs> so <laughs> so he, he would basically, uh, you know, navigate around and avoid the obstacle that Searle puts up by means of a functionalist account, okay? So another, uh, if you're all, you know, you grasp that, what Turing not being alive anymore couldn't say, I'm just kind of hypothesizing the nature of the response that that Turing would likely to be giving Searle, could he be alive and, and read that argument about the Chinese room. So um, if you're happy with that, I'll go on to the next argument, which is the third objection I want to raise uh, with you. And this objection is even more dehumanizing in a certain sense. And it's an objection that would be made by behaviorists. And uh, let me explain that. Uh, behaviorism is actually a, a modern school of psychology. Some of you may have heard of it. Maybe some of you studied it. You tell me, okay? I'm typing in the word. Uh, behaviorism. Does that ring a bell with anybody? That word behaviorism. It does. Okay. So where did you hear about it? What? Oh, many of you were saying yes. Good. It's a good thing. A lot of people are saying yes. Okay. So where did this come up? We did you learn about it in psychology or normally you'd learn about it? Yeah, it's a, it's a branch of psychology. So okay, good. So you learned about it in psychology. So maybe there's a lot of people who haven't. I'll give you my version of what it's saying. And of course, it's it's based on, it's based, I'll just type this in. You know this already, those of you who studied. It's based on theory, based on, let me just try and type, based on the theory of S-R, okay? It's S-R, or in other words, stimulus-response, okay? That's the, the theory at the foundation of behaviorism. It's called SR theory or stimulus response. In other words, what behaviorists assert, just enter this, okay? Does that um, corroborate your experience with what you were taught about behaviorism? Yes, it's stimulus response theory, yeah. And it's very interesting. It came out of the early 20th century, and the first one to discover this kind of empirically, was not a psychologist, was actually um, a neuro, or a physiologist rather, named Pavlov. Uh, anybody know about Pavlov's experiment? You all do. Well, you must have got it from the same source, right? Because that's the root of behaviorism. It came out of Pavlov. So again, those of you who don't know, it's pretty scary because it's they do it to us too all the time. We're being conditioned all the time. Um, and what Pavlov did was it's called, um, as some of you already know, yes, conditioning, operant conditioning. More insidious than mere conditioning. 
It's called operant with the dogs, exactly right. Operant conditioning. So for those who don't know, I'll just summarize it. Pavlov, uh, who was a physiologist, not a psychologist, he took a bunch of dogs, you know, that were in captivity in cages like a kennel. And dogs, you know that if you give food to dogs, they salivate, right? They salivate a lot. And do you know why they do that? Why We do too, by the way, humans salivate. It's because saliva contains pre-digestive enzymes. So actually, it's not easy for us to digest food. We need to do it. But food has to be broken down. In order for us to derive nutritional value from food, it has to be digested. Um, you know, it's a complicated process. And digestion doesn't just start when we swallow food in the stomach. That's where more digestion occurs. But there's also pre-digestion. And in our saliva, there are enzymes that start to break food down. Dogs have more saliva, more enzymes, because dogs bolt their food. Dogs don't chew and masticate their food as much as humans do. They basically bolt chunks of food, right? And they salivate in order to start breaking that food, even as they're bolting it. It gets coated with these enzymes and starts to digest, even in their mouths, which it doesn't stay long in, right? So uh, if you show a dog a bowl of food, the dog will begin to salivate because that's its instinct. That's how it begins to digest. So Pavlov was feeding his dogs, and every time he fed his dogs, he rang a bell. Now, what happened is because dogs can learn, they started to associate the sound of the bell with food. Every time he'd ring the bell, he'd present food to them. And of course, when he presented food to them, they'd salivate. So what he then did was after they were conditioned to associate the sound of the bell with food, one day he just rang the bell and didn't give them any food. And what did they do? They salivated at the sound of the bell. <laughs> now, now, this is like earth shaking for Pavlov, 1905, I think, something like that. It was earth shaking. Why? Because there is no dog in nature. There's no wolf or member of that family. There's no fox, coyote, wolf, you know, or domesticated dog or any member of the, of the felines, or even the felines or the, or the canines, the, the vulpines. The, there's no member of, the, of that family that salivates when they see food that, that will ever salivate at a bell being rung in nature. Even if they heard a bell, uh, it wouldn't make them salivate. But Pavlo artificially induced salivation at the sound of a bell. That's called conditioning. And he, he, in other words, the stimulus of a bell to put it back into behaviorist theory, the stimulus of a bell elicited the response of salivation, which it was not natural for these dogs to do. Is this clear? So this behavioral programming that we call conditioning was so powerful that it was able to induce a behavior in the dogs that was nothing to do with nature, it was totally artificial, totally man-made, totally contrived behavior to salivate at the sound of a bell. Didn't help the dogs to do that, but they were conditioned to do it and didn't take that long. So that is the basis of behaviorism. And stimulus response theory then in its more full-blown uh, context with respect particularly to animals and uh, other animals and humans is that you can teach animals to behave in whatever way you want. You can elicit behaviors which we call responses, right? Behaviors of responses to stimuli. And the theory is that a certain, you can always get the behavior you want by conditioning animals with the appropriate stimulus. And they do this in tons of ways. They do this in tons of ways. You can keep herd animals penned up with one small electric wire. You don't need, you, before that, before the advent of the electrified fence, you needed fencing. If you had herd cattle or horses or big, you know, big powerful animals, and you wanted to fence them in, that was very expensive. Imagine building miles and miles big enclosure. It's very expensive to build a big enclosure. It's much cheaper with one wire, right? And eventually, you can even put that wire on the ground, and they won't step over it because they see that wire, and they associate that wire with the chalk, and so they won't, they won't go, they will not step over that wire even though they could easily step over it. They won't leave the, they'll be, they'll be 
in self-enclosed because they've been conditioned to avoid that wire. So you can, you know, condition a certain response response from you find the right stimulus. When this gets applied to human beings, it becomes very contentious because you can very easily, unfortunately, program people too, right? Now, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's good. Um, and where it works uh, well, I think effectively, clinically, is, for example, what, what is called um, behavioral uh, therapy. Uh, people who have phobias, um, that's irrational. P people who are, have irrational fears of things cannot be helped by philosophy because um, you, philosophy is rational. And if you know that a fear is irrational, even if you know oh, I shouldn't be afraid of spiders or I shouldn't be afraid of elevators, or you're saying in your rational mind it's not rational to be afraid of you know this is out or the other, you still have a phobia, right? It's irrational but you can't defeat it by rational thought. But they can defeat it with behaviorism because they will desensitize you. It's called desensitization. You probably learned this too. And so gradually, you can, by getting closer and closer to the thing you're afraid of, by very, very small increments, you will learn that there's nothing to be afraid of. And so that finally, that stimulus that produced you know, anxiety and fear in you will no longer produce anxiety and fear. Uh, because of uh, uh, behavioral reconditioning. And that's very good. That That's used as a therapy to help people to overcome phobias. It's a good thing, because uh, phobias are, are irrational. Um, now, it can also be used in other ways. Uh, and, of course, it can be used uh, in uh, when people are, um, are basically being brainwashed or people are being indoctrinated uh, or people are being conditioned in other ways, uh, politically, ideologically, um, and in other, and psychologically, then it can obviously do harm to people. And there was this notion in behaviorism that you could condition people to be good, <laughs> right? That the SR theory says that hey, um, you know, we can condition any response we want. Uh, we just have to find the appropriate stimuli. So if you want to have quote unquote good citizens or law-abiding citizens, people who behave, you know, with kindness or people who behave with, who are not aggressive or not violent. You want people who are, you know, um, um, safe to be around and so forth. Um, you could reprogram them through SR theory. That was a theory. It still is a theory. There's a great movie about this. There's a great novel and a movie based on that novel. I'm going to type in the title. You're going to tell me if anybody seen this if you're curious to see um, a movie that uh, is opposed to this is that it, you know programming people to be good that it can't be done actually that we have to choose to be good we'll talk about this in our next section okay but there's a very very famous movie from the 70s by uh, one of my favorite American directors Stanley Kubrick it's called a clockwork orange based on a novel uh, has anybody heard of this movie? Nobody's heard of this. You No, okay. I didn't think so. This movie is very, very uh, controversial. When it came out in the 70s, it was actually banned. It's set in a, a fictional, it's like science fiction, but not quite. Um, it's about a bunch of really nasty juvenile delinquents, like a gang. Uh, they're very violent. Uh, but the leader is a kind of... It's really funny. The leader of this gang, he's almost like a, he's almost likable. Okay, what I mean to say is he's leading a bunch of really violent people, and they're doing horrible crimes, right? To totally horrible. But this guy has a kind of likable side. He has this kind of like side that you think, well, I could, I would, I could almost, if this guy weren't a violent criminal, like I would like this guy. You know what I mean? He's played that way. And the government decides instead of throwing these people in jail, the government decides to subject him to a behavioral therapy experiment. And they literally condition him to stop being violent. So he's incapable of violence. And then the test is they get some bully. They bring him out on a stage. I'm not going to ruin the movie. In front of these government officials and psychologists, behaviorists, who've conditioned this guy to be incapable of violence. And they bring this bully out on stage to bully this guy. 
and mercilessly bullies this guy, and it's really pathetic. And the guy and the character wants to hit him. He wants to, you know, retaliate, but he's behaviorally they made it's they made it impossible for him to do this. And the, so the question the movie's asking is that is it really possible to condition people to be morally good or isn't that a choice that we have to make ourselves so we have to be free to be good uh, we have to choose good and if we're morally con if we're behaviorally conditioned we're not really choosing it so we're not really good yeah that's a question for next next section i just leave that with you so what the behaviorist response to come back to the main point the behaviorist response to cyril it's not even as sophisticated as the formalist response because for behaviorists, your internal state is not important. You get this SR. What's that hyphen stand for? Hyphen stands for whatever's supposed to be happening in your mind between the stimulus coming in and the response going out, like something's supposed to be going on in your internal state. The functionalist will say the stimulus is changing your internal state and your response is, of course, your output. Behaviors don't want to deal with the internal state. Behaviors are not talking to you about how you feel. Behaviors are not asking you how you feel, or what, you know, they're not talking to you about your internal state. Behaviorists are only saying if we apply a certain stimulus, we can get the desired response. So they're even boiling functionalism down to two levels instead of three. And so a behaviorist is going to say to you, if someone says good morning, how are you? And you say, I'm fine, thanks, how are you? You're just reciting a response without even thinking about it. That's just a behaviorist stimulus response, right? You're so used to doing that that you don't need an internal state anymore. It's just become your conditioned response. Good morning, good morning. How are you? Fine, thanks, and you. That's a conditioned response. You don't even need what Turing calls an internal state to make that happen, okay? So behaviorism reduces us to even more simple machines, just stimulus response machines without even an internal state. So in a certain sense, philosophically, you could say it somehow impoverishes uh, the human being by taking mind out of the equation altogether, all right? But there's nonetheless the behaviorist account. Uh, the person in the U.S. who's most famous for this is Skinner. His name is Skinner. Okay. He was a psychologist at Harvard. And uh, it's Skinner who was the uh, leading American behaviorist. And you can look him up if you want to. Uh, you'll find him very quickly if you Google behaviorism and Skinner. Okay. So that's just to give you another response to Searle. Uh, which is that we still don't need, I mean, the behaviorist doesn't even need understanding either, even less than the functionalist needs it. The behaviorist is going to say when we talk to each other, it's all stimulus and response. We don't need understanding at all. You've just learned the appropriate response to whatever the stimulus is, as expressed in this case linguistically. All right. Now the paradox, okay? I, I remember I told you there was a, something paradoxical going on in this room uh, to me paradoxical uh, something puzzling and Searle didn't really talk about it or didn't even uh, wasn't necessarily aware of it um, uh, but here here's the deal what's in the room I'll go back to the picture remember the picture so there's somebody in the room we're going back to the Chinese room in the Chinese room there's somebody who doesn't understand Chinese, but who has what? Has an instruction set and a database, correct? And that database has all, we're saying for the sake of argument, all possible questions in Chinese, and associated with each question is an answer, right? And the instruction set is saying, when you get the input, match it with the database, start matching it up, and when you hit a match, then, your output is whatever is associated with that match. Very simple. You don't need to understand Chinese. You can produce intelligent output. No problem. Okay. So we need that catalog, right? Because without the catalog, you can't do this. The Chinese room only works if there's a catalog, correct? Are you with me so far? Somebody there? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We need that catalog. 
here's my question. Here's my question to you and Cyril. Where did that catalog come from? How did how did you manage to get a catalog of, for the sake of argument, all possible questions in Chinese with 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 correct answers associated with them? How where did that catalog come from? That's like for Cyril a given thing. Okay, you're in a room. You don't speak Chinese. Okay, you're in a room. You have a catalog. You have instructions. Go for it. Where's this catalog come from? He just supposed the catalog exists. I'm asking a harder question. Where did this catalog come from? How could you how could you compile such a catalog? Anybody want to suggest? How do we get such a catalog together? How do we build that database? Where would it come from? Yes, Mame, it came from someone who speaks Chinese. Exactly. The only way we could get that catalog, it wouldn't be just one person. Imagine we're talking about, we would have to get people to do part of that catalog. It would have to be geography, history, science, sports, current events, right? Because we don't know what question we're going to get. So we'd have to have a very big catalog, right? We need like a lot of storage space. These days it'd be up on the cloud and you'd be downloading stuff. but. Essentially, that catalog could only be compiled by someone who speaks Chinese, exactly. Or rather, an army of people who speak Chinese, depending how big you want the catalog to be, right? So in other words, that catalog could only be created by people who understand Chinese. Because if they didn't, it wouldn't make any sense. So wait a second. If that catalog, which is essential to the whole experiment, the whole thought experiment, if the whole allegory depends on that catalog. If that catalog needs to be compiled by an army of people, arguably a lot of people who understand Chinese, then it means that a simulation of understanding actually does require understanding. Because what Searle is claiming is that a simulation of understanding does not require understanding. But in fact, that's not true. Because in order to simulate an understanding of Chinese, you need that catalog. But you could only get that catalog from people who understand Chinese. So, so in fact, I don't want to puzzle you or, or confuse you, but those of you who understand this allegory as Searle presents it will now understand the objection I'm making. That, in other words, an understanding of uh, a simulation of understanding actually does require understanding implicitly not explicitly by the person who's operating the system that person doesn't need to understand chinese but the database could only be built only be assembled by people who do understand chinese so if you if you're going to claim that the chinese room can simulate an understanding of chinese without understanding that's not quite true because you need the database to do that and the database depends on an understanding of chinese and therefore if you want to simulate an understanding you still need an understanding but this strange to say the weird part is that that doesn't do any violence to Searle's argument because actually we go back to the same question how did that catalog get assembled by people who understood Chinese oh so in other words they couldn't have done this without understanding so a simulation of understanding requires understanding but that understanding itself is still not reducible to a complex algorithm because the people who assembled the catalog could not do it with a computer. They needed to use their own understanding to do it. So it, it, it doesn't disprove Searle's claim, namely that understanding is irreducible. It just makes his claim a little more complicated because it's not quite true that an under, a simulation of understanding requires understanding. It's true that a simulation of flight does not require flying. It's true that a simulation of evacuating a building in case of a fire does not require anything to be burning. But it's not true that a simulation of understanding does not require understanding. It does require understanding. But that only in the end, in a really strange way, strengthens Searle's bigger claim, namely that understanding cannot be reduced. So it's irreducible. You, you, you need it to simulate it. You need it to, to do it either way. And that's, that's a little bit of a paradox. Those of you who are maybe confused by that, you can ignore me, okay? It's not, it's more advanced question that occurred to me from teaching this reading. 
But it, the main thing I want you to understand is, you know, the reading in the first three objections we've discussed today, namely the Churchland reductionist objection, the formalist objection that we're all, uh, you know, we're all um, computers anyway, and the behaviorist uh, objection, which even simplifies things to stimulus response and omits the internal state as even being relevant in many cases. Um, and now that, that's basically it for Searle and for some objections that might be raised against Searle and how, you know, one might reply to them, okay? So with that, we have officially finished this first chunk of readings in the course. Well done that you've uh, attended and, and contributed and got through them. And remember that your first essay is going to be due on the 12th of October. I'm giving you an extra time, extra time uh, for this. Uh, so uh, you can do your best and upload it. Whenever you're ready, you can upload it on Blackboard. Uh, that portal is open. Make sure you upload it on Blackboard, please. Don't email it to me as an attachment. I won't accept it that way. It has to be uploaded. All right. So next day, we start a new section of the course. And I'll type in the reading. It's in your textbook. We're going to start the second section of this course, right? Out of three. Part two is called Ethics. And justice. So this, I'm, I'm guessing, more than guessing, is going to be very interesting and applicable because of the times we live in. Um, for philosophers, it's a very old story. We have a lot to say about ethics and justice. This has inherently been an issue that philosophers addressed since the beginning of time. I mean, since the beginning of philosophical time. We've been interested in these questions. So what is right? What is what is, what is good? What is right? What is just? Fundamental ethical questions. And we'll be discussing those uh, from the point of view, again, of a set of readings. And I'm going to give you some really foundational readings. So you will be able, by the end of the subsequent section, you'll be able to see, I hope, how many, if not most, of the contemporary problems that we're struggling with are already treated foundationally in these readings. So we're still trying to solve problems, but the, 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 the actual elaboration of those problems and the options we have and the difficulties with the options are all things that philosophers have already discussed, okay? Melody asks, for the Necromachean Ethics, are we reading all three books? Well, no, this is, uh, we're reading the extracts in the assigned text. That's why there is an assigned text. So you're absolutely right about the name of the book. It's Aristotle. Our first reading is Aristotle. I can type him. Aristotle. And he wrote two books on ethics. We're looking at his most famous one, the Nicomachean Ethics, named for his son Nicomachus. Um, the Nicomachean Ethics. But we're not reading the whole thing. It's quite a big book. And we are only going to read... Uh, the parts of uh, Nicomachean ethics. We're only reading the parts of Nicomachean ethics that are extracts. We're not reading everything. The extracts are definitely in the textbook. Trust me, Melody. Uh, you look in the table of contents, and I guarantee you um, there's a section with ethics in it, and you will you will see um, Aristotle in there, and that's the, the extracts we're going to look at. Uh, Nicomachean Ethics is the name of the text. Uh, it's a big book, but we're not going to obviously read the whole book. We're going to look only at the extracts, and I promise you'll find them there. We start that on Monday in the plenary. We'll, as, as usual, spend a week uh, on, on Aristotle. And I have uh, a lot to tell you about the, the Greeks, Aristotle and Plato. Very, very interesting in terms of their views on ethics and justice. Very interesting, and I'm sure you'll be engaged by this. So... You can read extracts. Uh, read your, if you have the assigned text already, please look for Aristotle in there. I promise you'll find what he has to say. And we'll cover it on uh, Monday in the plenary. And also, of course, on our breakout lecture next Thursday at this time. Okay? So Aristotle next week, the first of five readings in the, in the second part of this course. Any questions before we sign off for today? Everyone's okay? Okay, fine. Very well. 
And very well. No questions. You're very welcome, all of you. I wish you, in that case, a very, a very good day for the rest of the day. Have a great day. Enjoy your week. Uh, enjoy your weekend. It's, it's Thursday today, right? You're more than welcome, everybody. Thank you for your participation and your contributions, as always, are welcome. Your, you know, your questions and your comments, always welcome. And you have a nice weekend, too. I'll stop the recording now, and I'll look forward to seeing you all, or some of you, hopefully, in the plenary on Monday. And then again on Thursday, but Aristotle's on the menu, okay? So start reading your Aristotle. Uh, he's quite readable, and uh, we'll cover him next week. Okay, bye-bye for now. Be well, everyone. Take care.